Welcome back to the second half of our week two lecture. This is week two, chapter two, line and shape. This is another definite, definition heavy chapter. Visual elements of art. Art is made up of several visual elements these are the building blocks, building blocks of visual art. Line, shape, light, value, color, texture, space, time, and motion. Line. There it is. Think back to high school, think back to geometry. What is the definition of a line? You might describe the definition of a line in geometry as uh, so, like something going between two points. It might be something that goes beyond two points, infinite. A line might be, uh, lines will have relationships to circles and squares in different ways, different mathematical relationships. And that's not all untrue with art. Well, what's the definition of line in the environment? I would argue that in the environment, as you are sitting down, staring at your computer, you can look up just at the top edge of the computer and you see a line traveling from left to right of the top edge of your computer. That line really is the edge of your computer and the edge of where everything else behind your computer starts. In the environment, I argue that lines are made when one object overlaps with another object. Line. A line can be either actual or implied. Lines show movement, visual elements. They show thresholds that delineate between an object and its environment. A line can be a necessary tool or an element to be investigated. I think this is a really cool image by an artist named, I can't, John Mealy, who uh, must have been a photographer. I'm not really familiar with his work, but he did photograph, in this instance, Pablo Picasso, who apparently had a, uh, a flashlight in his hand, and in this time-lapse photograph was drawing a figure in air, the outline of a drawing. I think it's a very cool image. All right, so what are the characteristics of line? These are the terms we'll be covering. Measure. We'll be covering the types of lines. Expressive qualities of lines. Contour lines. Actual and implied lines. And psychological lines. Measure. The measure of a line consists of the dimensions of the line. In geometry, the line is infinitely thin. However, in art, the line is physical and can be counted. Measure is the thickness and the length of a line. So looking at this image, we have all of these strips of paper. 
there is a line made at the edge of the paper that is one of the lines that's sort of infinitely thin. Well, there's a point where this paper stops and this paper begins. But we can look at this pink section, I am circling, we can look at this pink section and really talk about the qualities of that section. So we have a line that is, you know, so long and a line that is so wide. Who knows, it might be 24 inches long, it might be 48 inches long. We have this line as well, which is skinnier than that line. So you can describe these two lines in reference to each other. To reiterate, lines in artwork often have a thickness to them. They have a width and they have a length. And we can talk about the properties of the lines in that way. Types of lines. Types of lines are infinite. They can be horizontal, da, 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 vertical, like this. They can be wavy. If you can see a line, you should be able to describe it. You can be creative in the words that you use, but just know that if you see a line in an artwork, try to figure out how to talk about it. Lines have expressive qualities. A line can be wrapped up in the complexities of emotion. Lines can direct a person how to feel or how an object or movement should be perceived. Consider delicate, elegant, assertive, forceful, speed, whimsy, cold, clinical, etc. These are all descriptors that can describe the line quality. Expressive qualities, the way a line makes the viewer feel or the messages that they convey. So use the descriptors to describe your expressive qualities. What are the expressive qualities of this painting? Well, first of all, I see lines that are going up and down and left and right in a grid pattern. To me, it seems very regimented. It seems very cold. You can use these words. I wouldn't say delicate, maybe elegant, I'd assertive because the lines are going so boldly and so straight. It seems like a cold environment. If I were to step into the painting, it seems cold. Something that I wouldn't be able to relate to. Almost like a hospital. Or just an uncomfortable room. Perhaps you like the organization of this painting and perhaps you would like to stand within it, within the environment. Here are two different styles of artworks. How could you describe the expressive qualities of these lines? I think that there's a lot of confusion in the lines, perhaps aggression, perhaps I feel a bit maybe sadness or just scrambled up. I do feel a lot of confusion when I look at this. When I look at this artwork, I see lines that are well ordered. They all fit nicely within their places. I see organization, but I also see it feeling clinical, almost like that last painting seems very cold.
contour. Contour lines go around the edges of the object. They might even go through the object or a person, especially following shadows and the shape of the, of the person. Contour lines are a little bit different than outlines, though. An outline is an actual line, a concrete mark that defines the boundary or outer edge of an object or figure. A contour line is not an actual line, but an edge that is perceived where a three-dimensional form curves away from the viewer. I would say that this drawing has some a lot of outline in it but I do see contours through the body. This knee. The way the calf moves there. In this image, shadows not only hide features, but they distinguish contours so that they are especially vivid. So let's look for some contours on this image. I see contours along the tops of the legs and around the knee. Those are also outlines. I see contours here and here. But look at the shadows. Are there other contours? This line here, does it stop there or does it also extend up here? Does this have contours caused by shadows? I think so. Contours move freely through objects, but they generally follow the lines of shadows the paths of shadows. So let's talk about implied lines. An actual line is a line that is readily seen and actually within an image. This is an actual line. It's like you take a pencil and draw a swirl that is the actual line. But if, what if you draw that same swirl and then you erase in between and you get all these little dots? Well, I still see a line, though that line isn't actually there. This is called an implied line. An implied line is a suggested line that is completed by the viewer. Your brain puts it together. Another famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci. You see this pyramid that I have drawn on here? I see a line that starts at this baby's foot, goes up his butt, and it follows here. I also see a line that travels down this woman's arm, and it follows this crease here. These are implied lines. See this line? follows that shadow. This is sort of complex, but you can you'll see, especially in a lot of older paintings, that they're organized in ways like this. Another definition, psychological line. A psychological line is created by a mental or perceptual connection. 
An artist may draw your attention in a direction through actions or cues that force a relationship between two objects. In this case, there are many, many psychological lines happening in the painting. We have this woman looking at her shoe. She's embarrassed, it looks like. That boy who's staring right at that man, that man is looking at this painting. This guy is looking at what that guy's looking, is looking at that guy's face. So is he. These are psychological lines. They are two separate objects within a painting where your brain is forced to consider the relationship between the two objects. What are the functions of line? Lines outline and shape, they show depth and texture, they show illusions of volume and mass. One of the great functions of line is its innate ability to outline an object. Consider contour lines, contours. Line defines a shape as being separate from surrounding space. Here we have a, an image, but this black silhouette is imposed on top of that image. This is an outline, outline of a shape. And then there's another outline of another silhouette reversed looking the other direction. Again, outline and shape. Depth and texture. When used as texture, line can draw attention to features, suggest light and shadow, and even create a sense of form. This is a really great, very small, what's called engraving by a Renaissance artist named Durer. He, people usually refer to him by his last name. Oop, page not found. We'll have to go come back to that. Well, in this drawing, or little um, engraving, if you look really closely, you would be able to find lines. You can see them going around the tree. These are contour lines, many, many, many tiny contour lines that are really showing the volume of an object. If you pull out a dollar bill, you see George Washington's face, and you can see, if you look closely, contour lines that go along George Washington's face. Well, these lines can collectively form a depth they can show depth and they can show texture. Jagged lines in particular would show texture, but the direction the line travels can really show depth. This is an example of what we would have been seeing. In two-dimensional art especially, artists use depth and texture of line to achieve a sense of volume, light, shadow, and atmosphere. Stippling. Dots varied in density and frequency. That is this. When dots get closer together, they create a shadow. Farther apart, less shadow. Hatching are par parallel lines. When the lines get closer together, again, shadow. When they are farther apart, highlights. 
cross-hatching or lines that go opposite directions. But it's a similar concept. Lines closer together make shadow. Lines farther apart make highlights. Look at your dollar bill. Look at comic books. Look at drawings that you see in print in particular. They are made with the strategy of stippling or hatching or cross hatching and they show the illusions of volume and mass. The characteristics of shapes. Shapes uh, will talk about geometric shapes, organic shapes, non-objective and abstract shapes, shapelessness. We'll also talk about figure ground reversal and iconic shapes. Shapes. Shapes are distinct areas within a composition. Of course, in two-dimensional art especially, shapes are defined by contour lines. Contour lines provide a border, however, shapes are often communicated through patches of color, texture, or value. Variations on shapes are infinite. Just like lines are infinite, so are variations on shapes. I think this is a good example to, to show of shapes because this artist, he really, I mean, imagine cutting out construction paper and gluing it down. That's really what this is, how this was made. So he was cutting out shapes. There are geometric shapes. Geometric shapes may be derived from mathematical formulas and are rendered with great precision. Think back to high school class, uh, classes think about geometry, those are geometric shapes. Rectilinear shapes are shapes that have straight edges and angular corners. Curvilinear shapes have curving edges. So to describe this artwork, I see geometric shapes being these this tilted square and this square and I also see rectilinear shapes, which are essentially, in this instance, the same thing. They look like rectangles. They have straight edges. Even though this line from there to there, there and there, create a triangle, I would say it is both geometric and rectilinear because it has straight edges and angled corners. I would not say that curvilinear applies to this image. Curvilinear does apply to this image, this image of organic shapes. Organic shapes are derived from the world of living things. So this is an image of a flower an iris, I suppose. These are curvilinear. They're not geometric. They're not rectilinear. They show curve. You might describe the big gray area, though, as rectilinear. Non-objective and abstract shapes. Non-objective shapes make no reference to visible reality. Abstract shapes are connected to the world of visible reality, though that connection may be tenuous. Would you describe this painting as being non-objective or abstract 
or both. I've had students in the past say that they see a figure, a person. The title of the piece is The Passage from Virgin to Bride. So I think that represents a sex scene. So maybe there are multiple people. But I have a hard time seeing the people. It's not that they're not there. I would say a lot of these shapes are non-objective, though you wouldn't be wrong to argue that they are non-objective and abstract. Again, abstract shapes are connected to the visible world or reality. So if you were to say that this is abstract, you might say, look, there's an arm, there's a head, there's a body. Shapelessness. Amorphous shapes lack clear definition. Works with amorphous shapes may create a shapeless impression. Another painting by the artist Helen Frankenthaler. I refer to this painting as amorphous, as having amorphous shapes because I don't really recognize any logic to the shapes. There are no straight edges, so it's not geometric, and it's not representational of any object in the real life, so I'm not sure it's even abstract, because remember, to be abstract, it should be representational of of the real world in some way. I think that this artwork is about, is of and about shapeless objects or amorphous objects. Figure ground reversal. I think this is a really great image. I'm sure you guys see this pile of women also doubles as a skull. If you're having a hard time seeing, go ahead and stand up and step back and the image will become more clear. The photographer is another artist I haven't heard of, Philippe Halsman. But I have heard of this guy, Salvador Dali. It appears they were. this was a collaboration. This is an image of Salvador Dali, and he was very famous, um, a very famous uh, surrealist artist. He did a lot of paintings, some sculptures. But he was very much interested in figure ground reversal, objects that appear one way at some angles and another way at other angles. A classic version of that is this here, which is, of course, the silhouette of two faces making a vase. Do you see the vase? And then you see the two faces? The idea that in the vase faces, but also in the skull bodies, the object and the figures, they, they sort of flip-flop back and forth. That is figure ground reversal. Here's a really old, ancient version of figure ground reversal from a culture called the Membres, Membre? Membres culture? from uh, the American Southwest. I think this is really great because they're doing, obviously, figure ground reversal. What we are looking at is a bowl or some sort of vessel or a pot. And we're looking down into the pot and there's a hole in the bottom of the pot. 
but we see how it's decorated. And so we see a person's face, maybe, with these feet that don't look very person-like. But we also see a bird. I think this is a really great example because it's really interesting to see that for a thousand years, certainly longer, we've been making art that really focuses with figure on figure ground reversal sometimes. Are there other figure ground reversal things happening? I do want to say that just because there is just because you don't see necessarily a recognizable object doesn't mean there is not fi a figure ground reversal happening. So if you were to remove the figure and the crane, you may see, you'll see the black and white patterns. And so black, white, black, it could be, you know, four black diamonds inside this rec white rectangle or it could be a white rectangle that's got four black diamonds cut out of it floating in a black field. This is a painting by the artist Salvador Dali who I was just talking about. This is another great painting and another great example of figure ground reversal. Do you see figure ground reversal happening? So when I look at this painting, especially up close, I see this pilgrim looking dude and another pilgrim look looking maybe woman. A baby, another figure, another figure, and another figure. All these figures. And I see something that looks like a fountain. But if you st step back and take a look at it, you might actually see that this cutout, this area is the forehead of a person. And that this makes the nose of a person and then the eyes, and this is shadow underneath the cheeks, and then here's the chin. And that is creating a head and these shoulders that come down and they stand on this weird looking object, and it looks like a bust of a figure. So that bust, what a bust is, is a sculpture of a head and shoulders generally that stands on a base. And so I see a figure standing on a base, but you have to look at it just right to see it. The last thing we're going to talk about in today's lecture is iconic shapes. Many shapes in popular culture are loaded with cultural meaning. The cultural meaning is a history of an image or symbol. So we can look here and see a symbol that you might have been seeing recently, a Black Lives Matter symbol, and that's made of a fist. Interestingly, though, this fist or fist similar to it have been used in other radical movements. This is one from several years ago. Where people were protesting um, sort of wealth disparities in our country where they were claiming that 99% or claiming that 1% of the country is wealthier than 99% of the country collective, collective. And so this is the 99% logo. Do you recognize Che Guevara? He's another iconic symbol, iconic shape, iconic of revolution. 
specifically communist revolution? How about Marilyn Monroe? Have you ever seen in a cartoon or in a movie someone, anyone other than Marilyn Monroe standing on top of a vent in the city and the dress flies up? Well, that's iconic shape. That's I iconic to Marilyn Monroe and it's referencing her in this photograph. Of course, we know Batman. And we might even recognize the Christian cross or the Jewish star of David. These are all iconic shapes. And there are many, many iconic shapes. McDonald's might be one, uh, like the, the arches, or even a heart. What does a heart represent? Uh, or any of the emojis on your phone. These are all iconic shapes. Here's a famous iconic shape, an iconic image. Um, I have labeled this image as a generic reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Have you seen this image before? Well, have you seen this image before? sort of makes you wonder what all the fuss is about. This is an actual photo of the actual painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. It's in really terrible condition. It's falling apart. It's been falling apart for, you know, 500 years. In fact, there's a doorway cut into it. We'll go back one image. This painting is so famous that there are many, many other versions of it that anyone will do. Just do a quick Google search and you'll see reproductions of it. This is, I'd say, very iconic. There's an artist named Ron English. He is very active in the sort of graffiti world and street art world. He's been around for, I don't know, 30 years. And he's been making lots of artwork that really uh, sort of is a mashup of popular culture and is often a criticism of popular culture. But anyway, he's obviously referencing Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper in the same way that whoever painted this is referencing it. I find this kind of a funny painting. Uh, it might be a little bit um, blasphemous if you care to call it that, but I think it's culturally relevant and very interesting. You have a fat Ronald McDonald in the middle, and then all of these cartoon characters, including Joe Camel, sort of leaning into him. But think of the iconic shapes here. You have a fat Ronald McDonald, you have a bling, a cheeseburger, but you recognize all of these characters. Mickey, Tony the Tiger, Popeye, Bugs Bunny, Joe Camel, Homer Simpson, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, Taz, Big Boy, Daffy Duck, and then a classic McDonald's in the back, and even you might recognize some of this wallpaper by the end of our class. But these are all referencing famous paintings. So I think it's a super interesting painting, but the painting and really the art of Ron English is all about using iconic shapes.
Week two lecture complete. It is now time to take and submit the weekly quiz. The quiz will be on the content of both chapter one and chapter two.